the proceedings. Yep. All right, everyone. So um, welcome to the first Campbell Center seminar of the new year. I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. Great to see such a big turnout today. Um, for those of us who are in Guelph, let's just take a moment to gratefully acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation on whose um, traditional and treaty lands we're living and working. And while I have all of you, if you want to know about some of the more welfare relevant sides of Canadian colonial history, the Woodland Cultural Centre is running a virtual tour of Brantford's former residential school about 30 miles away from here on the evening of February 9th. Okay, so now let's turn to the start of today, and I'm really thrilled to have Dr. Rebecca Maha here today. Becky grew up in Kitchener just up the road. She studied zoology at U of T, and then I was lucky enough to woo her here, and she did a PhD with me, focusing on behavior and welfare in farmed mink, during which time she operationalized for the first ever time the concept of boredom in animals um, in a paper which won its 100th citation last year. And Becky then did something very strategic. She moved away from mink to learn about dairy cattle, and she moved away from Guelph to experience the research culture of another leading research group, the one at UBC. And then after about three postdoc years there, she won an assistant professorship at the University of Reading in the UK. Sorry if you can hear Luke the cat in the background. Um, but the call um, to home was too great and 2019 saw Bexit happening as she left the UK and moved back to Canada to take up an assistant professorship at Dalhousie. And this position gives her the unique opportunity to weave together both mink and dairy welfare research. Now, obviously, these are really different animals, but they've allowed Becky to develop some really original ideas and also experiments that examine the links between welfare and cognition. And that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So uh, Dr. Mahar, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's nice to be back in Guelph, even virtually for the day. So I was asked to talk about my work on cognition and the links between cognition and welfare and farmed animals. And I'm gonna start off by talking about how the environment affects learning and then what that might mean for the welfare of the animals. And then move on to talking about whether learning itself is actually important to them. And the research I'll be presenting is on dairy cattle. That's where I have done most of my research, but it does apply more broadly to other farm species and other captive animals as well. So we know there's a lot of variation among animals in their ability to learn. Certainly there are species differences in learning ability and in what type of learning they specialize in. And farmed animals are ones that haven't gotten a lot of attention in this area. A lot of people don't give many of our farm species like sheep credit for being very intelligent. But of course they do have to learn many things about their environment and about us when they're in captive environments. There are individual differences as well. There's a wide range of abilities within a species and some of that is genetic, but our knowledge of humans has told us that a lot of it actually has to do with their experience as well. It's not all genetic. And particularly there's been a lot of emphasis on the early environment and the information that we're exposed to and process when we're young might influence our abilities later in life. And there's research on this in rodents going back to the 1960s and 70s. The classic work on environmental enrichment was looking at more complex environments for the purpose of improving cognitive development. And then there's also recognition that the social environment might be important, that young animals are often learning from their parents or other members of their social group as they're developing their behavioral repertoire. So I'm gonna start off by talking about that aspect of early life, which has been the focus of a lot of my research. The first work on social deprivation and learning came from laboratory primates. So there was classic work in the 1960s and 70s, led initially by Harry Harlow, where they raised rhesus macaques in 
fairly extreme social deprivation conditions where they would spend a year of their life alone, often with a cloth dummy instead of a mother as shown in the picture here. And they showed that that had long-term implications for their anxiety, for their behavior. So they would be abnormal socially, they would show abnormal repetitive behaviors and neurobiological changes that lasted beyond that period of social deprivation. And that went along with impairments in cognition. So when we turn then to farm animals, the case of dairy calves, which have been the focus of a lot of my research is interesting because we do on farms commonly house them by themselves for the first weeks of life. So I've put statistics there from Ontario and from Britain, but this looks pretty similar across Canada and across many countries. Dairy calves are taken away from their mother and quite often they're put either in an individual pen or in some sort of hutch. And this is something that was of interest from a welfare perspective. It's something that raises a lot of public concern when the public are aware of this practice. People don't like that the calf is being taken from the cow which would be its main social partner in those first days. And the statistics I've shown there from a survey show that not only do most people not involved in the dairy industry not like this, but even a significant number of farmers are uncomfortable about the way we're treating calves. But it's quite difficult to think about how we would run dairy farms with calves in contact with the cows. And that's something people are working on. But in the meantime, we can think about housing them with social partners of their own age, at least, and about the physical environment as well. So often the two things go together, where if they're in a hutch, like the one shown here, it can be very restrictive in terms of physical stimuli as well, versus pens where they at least have visual and auditory contact with others. As was mentioned, I did a lot of work initially at the University of British Columbia in the animal welfare program. And when I moved there, they were already working on this issue. And some of their early work had showed that if you compared individually reared calves to ones that were raised in a pair, so the smallest, simplest social group you could put them in, those individual calves were more reactive when they were put in a novel environment. For example, they would defecate more, suggesting maybe they were more nervous in that situation. And when they were then moved to group pens, as would be the standard practice on all farms, in those first days, they ate less and they started to eat later than the pair calves. And the researchers had hypothesized that one of the reasons for this might be that they were cognitively impaired, like we see in socially deprived lab animals. So maybe they were having difficulty learning where the food was, learning to navigate the new feeders and everything else in this more complicated environment. So I became involved first with a study that had been conducted by Charlotte Gayard, looking at whether there was really a learning deficit in those individual calves. And she looked first at their ability to recognize novel objects. So pair housed calves, if they were exposed to an object repeatedly, showed a decrease in exploration over time, indicating that they recognized it, didn't need to investigate it anymore but the individually housed calves didn't seem to show that same curve of learning about it and not needing to explore anymore. And then she tested the reversal learning, which is a measure of cognitive flexibility. And so she used a Y maze for this shown in the figure here where the calf would come in, it would have to make a choice whether to go left or right. And what it could see was a colored square on the wall in front of it. So in this example, if the square was white, that side would have milk that it could get once it went down that alley. The black square, that side wouldn't have any milk. So the calves could learn which color meant reward. And then the meaning of the colors was swapped. So suddenly the milk would be on the side with the black. And she found that the pair housed calves would eventually figure this out and start going to the color that was now rewarded but the individually housed calves had difficulty with that. I then did another experiment trying to look at this in more depth and look at how much social contact was important and at what age, 
as well as trying to bring that back to the effects on emotional states that had been reported. And so in this study, we had four treatments. There was the standard individual pen shown on the top left, pair pen below that, which was just double the width with two calves. And the bottom right is our complex social group where they had contact with other calves and with their mother, although they couldn't nurse from her. And so they were housed for the first eight weeks of life in those treatments. The fourth treatment, they were put initially in an individual pen, and then at six weeks old, they were opened up so they would be in a pair pen. And so this was to test whether those first six weeks were really crucial, whether there was a sensitive period for the effects of social contact. And what I hypothesized was that increasing levels of social contact would improve cognitive flexibility that we would be able to see in this reversal learning task. That we would see increased anxiety in the individually housed calves as we had before. And that pairing at a later age wouldn't fully compensate. That it's this early exposure to social information that was important. And then finally, I wanted to check whether the differences in fear or anxiety actually explained the cognitive differences, because we know in humans that that can interfere with learning if you're in a state of stress. For example, you pay less attention to the task. And so I wanted to know if this was actually the reason for the cognitive deficit. So again, we used a reversal task. In this case, instead of the maze, we had computer screens and it was a go, no-go task, meaning they had to go to the positive color if they wanted a reward. So here that would be a red screen signaled they could get milk. And they had to stay away from a white screen, not approach it because they would get a timeout where they couldn't earn any milk. And once they had learned that, then we did the reversal where suddenly then white meant they should approach and red meant they shouldn't. And I'll show you what that looked like. So this is a calf in its testing pen. It's drinking from the milk bottle right now. And it's gonna go over to this start box on the right wall. And that turns on the computer screen and you can see the calf approached the red screen, came back to get its milk reward. And clearly it's learned not to go to the white. So you see some frustration, but it stays there and keeps touching its nose to the box until it gets the rewarded color. So the calves were very good at this. They're very motivated to get their milk. All of them learned the initial task. The differences are when we actually switch the meaning of the colors. So this is what it looked like for the group. You see, it took about 10 sessions, but eventually some of those calves started behaving appropriately for the new rule. They started going to the white and not to the red. And by 22 sessions, the majority of them were performing at our success criterion. The individually housed calves, most of them didn't figure it out at all in that time. So only 20% of them reached the learning criterion in the time we gave them. And the other treatments fell in between. So the pair housed calves ended up looking the same as this more complex social group. The late pair were not quite as good, but they tended to be better than the individually housed calves in terms of the proportion that were successful in the task. So potentially there is some sort of gradient here where early social contact is important, but there can be improvements if it's introduced later in that period. In terms of their fearfulness, we used a novel object test. So the latency to approach the novel object is taken as a sign of how afraid they are of it. And this was done at six weeks. So we only had three treatments because the late pairs hadn't been paired yet. And you can see here that the latency was shorter for the ones from the complex social group, suggesting that they were less fearful. In this study, the pair housing wasn't enough to produce that difference in fear. And this behavior in this test didn't correlate with their learning ability. So it didn't seem that the fear was actually causing the problems with learning. They seemed to be two independent effects of the housing.
Now, more recently, a student I'm working with at the University of Reading, Chen Yu Zhang, has been looking at the importance of the social environment and the physical environment relatively. And so he's using a factorial design where he has the single or pair housing like that other study, but he's also got them in either physically enriched conditions or not. And so the barren individual pen is shown here, looks very similar to the other study. The physical enrichments we used were designed to satisfy natural motivations we know the calves have, like sucking. So they got a blind teat and a brush for grooming. They had slow feeder bags full of hay, and there was a scent added to the hay to try to increase their exploration and interaction with that. And then there was a chain for them to simply manipulate. And we had shown in previous work that they did use these enrichments and they reduced non-nutritive sucking, which is an abnormal behavior seen in calves. So they seem to be improving their welfare. And so the most enriched treatment was the pear housed pen that had all of these items for both calves. And he's been looking at a range of effects of this. So he's looked at their home pen behavior and their growth through the eight weeks up to weaning. And again, physical enrichment seems to have some benefits. So it's reducing that non-nutritive sucking and it's increasing play behavior. And both things are improving their growth as well. When he did novel object tests and novel environment tests, he didn't find any effect of the enrichment or the pair housing in this case. But he then, once they had been weaned and moved into group pens, so they were all now in the same type of housing, he did a cognitive test. In this case, he used novel object recognition again, looking at whether they preferred to explore a novel object over a familiar one as expected if they recognized the familiar one. And so that's what this discrimination index is indicating. It's how much of a preference they had for the novel object. And you can see here the physically enriched ones shown in blue did prefer the novel object over the familiar 15 minutes after their first exposure to that item and the non-enriched ones didn't. So it does seem to affect their recognition of or their response to something novel. After 60 minutes, the difference was still there no longer statistically significant. And the Social environment didn't have a significant effect on it in this case. So it was the physical environment that seems to be affecting this simple form of memory. So altogether, the work on calf housing suggests that it can affect both emotional states and learning. Pair housing effects on fear of novelty and on simple forms of learning haven't been consistent maybe that's not strong enough on its own without physical enrichment. But the physical enrichment did affect simple learning. And the social housing comes into play when we look at this more cognitive, more complex cognitive ability of reversal learning or changing rules. So the individually reared calves seem to have a lot of trouble with that. And this general pattern sort of fits with what we see in other research. There's also been recent work on simply giving calves hay as the only change to the environment and that in itself affected reversal learning. And there's a meta-analysis across species that has shown that the physical environment seems to have larger effect sizes on cognitive ability than the social environment actually. In terms of what this means for their welfare, there's a couple of reasons to think that there is some association. So the problems are seen in the same types of environments are indicators of increased fear and abnormal behavior. We see in the same environments that are impairing cognition, even though the effects seem to be independent from what we could tell. But just being impaired in learning ability, specifically with flexibility, might be a welfare problem later on because it might interfere with them successfully adapting to change. And we know on farm, they're going to be put in new social groups, new pens, exposed to new management procedures. And so they might experience more stress in those situations. 
And that ties back to that early work where they seem to have more trouble when they first went into a group pen. Now, there is some reason for optimism, I think, in terms of the CAV specifically. There are shifts towards more group housing and less restrictive housing. So calves that are tethered, needing to have outdoor access, getting rid of tethering eventually and moving towards group housing at younger ages as our codes of practice are being updated. And I think with the public pressure and with the technology that helps us do this successfully, we're going to move away from those most stimulus poor environments that are causing these problems. Then I wanted to talk about whether the learning in itself actually matters for welfare. So there was a paper by Cheryl Meehan and Joy Mensch over 10 years ago suggesting that cognitive challenge in itself is important for animal welfare. And they argued that animals might be motivated to use the cognitive abilities that they've evolved to have. And that was based on a couple of things. One is that learning is intrinsically motivated in humans. It's something that we're motivated to do out of interest. And you see that from the pleasure or the satisfaction we get when we successfully learn how to do something. I think most of us here today probably are familiar with that. If we've chosen to pursue higher degrees, despite the stress that goes with that, we must find learning enriching. The other thing is that learning gives animals a chance to exert some sort of control over their environment or agency. And people have suggested that this is actually important for welfare. Certainly in humans it is, and potentially in animals as well. If they're being managed by humans, they might have limited opportunity for control over their environment and getting to learn how to do something is one way of letting them do that. So even though they might experience some frustration or stress as you give them a challenge, if they can successfully meet it, they might have positive emotions afterwards and a greater sense of agency and therefore overall their welfare will improve. And there's work from the species that we think of as very intelligent and cognitively complex like dolphins suggesting that this is the case. So Lori Marino and her group do work on free range dolphins where the dolphins are voluntarily coming and engaging with the learning tasks. And the fact that they choose to do this suggests that they do somehow find it rewarding. When we look at the cattle, there was an early study by Don Broom and one of his students where they gave heifers a discrimination task. And in the session where the heifers started performing appropriately, suggesting that they had figured out the task, they saw signs of what they considered possible excitement. So their heart rates went up, they showed more vigorous activity like bucking and kicking. And so they were suggesting that there was a positive emotion in response to this successful learning. And so I wanted to test whether they were actually motivated to have that experience. And I hypothesized that learning how to get a preferred feed would be more motivating than just receiving that feed without any need for learning or control. And I did this using a yoked design. So we had two treatments, the learning group and ones that were tied to what happened to the learning group. And first we taught them all an operant response of a nose touch to this plastic object hanging from a rope here. So they were initially clicker trained to do the nose touch and they would get feed, but eventually they would, instead of getting food right away, this gate would open and they could come into another area where we gave them a learning task if they were in the learning group. And we had this operant response on what's called a variable interval schedule. So after one successful response and them getting to come in and do the task, there would be a period of 20 to 40 seconds where it didn't matter what they did, we wouldn't open the gate again. And so we could look at how many times they performed the nose touch in that period as an indicator of how motivated they were to get back in and continue the task. 
We also looked at their latency to approach this hanging object at the start of a session as another indicator of motivation. So essentially it indicated that they were there and ready to start. So we thought that they would come to it more quickly if they were more motivated. The task that they were learning, if they were in the learning group, was again a discrimination task. It was both visual and by touch. So they would get a choice between two bins of feed. One was covered with a white plastic lid. One had lid with a piece of red foam on top. So it felt and looked different. And the white lid would signal what type of food was inside. So for half of those, it would be straw. For half, it would be grain and vice versa. And they want to get the grain. They're motivated to get to the grain. So they had to learn to push off the lid of one bin, the one that they thought contained the grain, and the other one would be immediately taken away. So the control group that was yoked to these heifers would get whatever food their partner had gotten on that trial, but they would only have one bin. It would have a randomized lid. So there was no opportunity to learn to predict the food and certainly not to choose which food they got. So they weren't learning anything. When we looked at the number of operant responses they performed in that period, then you can see they were similar before we got to this difference between treatments. When we started the discrimination learning, there was a tendency for the learning ones to perform more nose touches as we predicted if they were more motivated. In terms of latencies in that phase, there was a significant difference. So the learning group were faster to approach and to start their session. And so that was consistent with our prediction that they actually were more motivated if they were getting to do this learning. The other thing we looked at similar to that dolphin work was just whether they would choose to do this at all. So we would hold sessions every week where we just opened the gate to the alleyway where we did the training to see if they would choose to come in. If one came in, we would then do a session with them. And with this, we didn't find a significant difference. The ones in the learning group weren't more likely to participate in these sessions, but you can see here that most of the time, all of the heifers in both groups did choose to come in and participate. So it seems like something about this was enjoyable for them. Maybe not the discrimination itself, but maybe they enjoyed the initial learning of the operant that they had all done and they had positive associations. Maybe it was the fact that they sometimes got grain. Maybe it was the fact that they could run around and explore this extra space we don't know, but for some reason they were choosing to engage with us. So there are challenges when it comes to interpreting this study on its own. One of the challenges was that we had some individuals we started trying to train and couldn't successfully train. So either they were too fearful and they were dropped after the clicker training stage because they just wouldn't approach us or eat the food. And there were a few then that dropped off later. They, for some reason, stopped engaging and performing the responses, whether that was because they lost interest or because they were still a little afraid or they were frustrated if they weren't understanding. There were some that we couldn't successfully get through the study. And so we can't forget about those ones in thinking about whether this is overall something that's beneficial for them. The voluntary participation obviously is a bit difficult to interpret in terms of what the motivation is for doing it. And it didn't correlate with our other measures. So we think it is a measure of a different motivation than the operant and the latency were. And then of course, this is one study of one group of heifers and the operant response, although it was in the predicted direction, it was just a statistical trend. So this does need replication. And particularly, it would be interesting to replicate it with animals with a different background. These particular heifers are ones that had been reared in group pens. They had had lots of human contact because they were on a research farm where there's lots of students around to give them positive attention. And so they might be more exploratory than some other heifers might be, depending on how they were raised.
So I think from this work, we can say that simple learning tasks might benefit the welfare of many cattle. And we should look into how that could practically be implemented. Obviously, you're not going to do this type of complex training with all of the animals on a farm, but there might be automated ways of working this type of learning into farm systems. But one of the challenges is that participation needs to be a choice in most cases, because we have these individuals that seem to find it very frightening or that might not have the same cognitive abilities and would just experience the frustration and not the positive emotions at the end. And so we need to try to allow for that in the systems and not be forcing animals to engage with these deeper forms of stimulation that they don't know how to engage with or are frightened by. And Finally, I wanted to say that although this was all with dairy cows, I think that a lot of species might benefit similarly. There's a little bit of work on other farmed species that would suggest this. So in pigs, people have used acoustic discrimination learning to call them to a feeder and found that they seem to deal with that quite well and that it seemed to reduce fearfulness. So potentially it was benefiting their welfare. In goats, like in the dolphins, we have evidence from other studies that they will choose to engage in a cognitive task and effectively work mentally for food that they could get for free otherwise. And in other animals like mink, we don't have this specific evidence that cognitive stimulation is important, but we know that the mink in standard farm conditions, even if they have minimal levels of physical enrichment added to the cage, that they show signs of boredom-like states. And so even if simple physical enrichment isn't resolving those, maybe if we can successfully devise ways of engaging their mental capabilities, maybe that would alleviate that problem. We know that's not going to be easy because we have tried and failed to train mink into cognitive tasks, but in theory, it might work if we can get the right system for them. So I think this is something that needs a lot more research and that we need to think about simple ways. So I basically want takeaways to be that our common forms of housing on farms right now could be impairing cognition as well as welfare. Physical enrichment certainly social enrichment when it comes to more complex abilities and the ability to be more flexible. And what this means is going back to our low opinion of a lot of farmed species abilities, we might be underestimating them right now because we're often rearing them in conditions that doesn't allow them to develop the full capabilities that their species could have. So maybe it's not true that these species aren't as intelligent. Maybe it's just the way that they're being housed. I think learning opportunities could promote positive well-being, and that's something that's getting a lot of attention in the field now that we're recognizing avoiding really negative states like fear and pain isn't enough. We want animals to be able to experience positive emotion to have a really good life or a life worth living. And learning is one thing that might provide for that. But that's only going to be true if we raise the animals to be prepared for those opportunities so they can meet the cognitive challenge. And if we're not forcing them on individuals who can't do so. Okay, and I just wanted to quickly thank the collaborators I didn't get a chance to mention and the research assistants who helped with these studies and the organizations who have supported them financially. And I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic. So